Thank you again. And now uh, I ask uh, Shri Mr. Babu uh, for the further um, program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your words. Yeah. Uh, before Sorry, we proceed yeah. with the with the two uh, lectures, actually, we have a short felicitation ceremony, and I'll ask uh, Onindo to kindly uh, upload the the PowerPoint pre presentation and the video which is there. Two students who belong to the weaker sections of society and uh, who have done wonderfully well in the HS and are now studying in two colleges are uh, going to be felicitated this afternoon. So, Anindo, will you please uh, start the PowerPoint presentation as well as the video which follows it. Over to you, Anindo. So, uh, this is Korobi Adho, who's passed from Bardhuman Vidyati Girls uh, High School and is now admitted to Shamshundar College. And uh, there is another girl who is, uh, whose name is Shriya Roy, who's also uh, done her HS from Horishava Hindu Girls High School. And she has also uh, done extremely well in her HS, and she has also gotten admission to the college. And uh, Bharat Bhita Chacha Kendra uh, has decided to felicitate uh, both of them. And there have been small tokens of uh, monetary support for them, as well as certifications, which were done uh, yesterday afternoon, actually, by our secretary, uh, Dr. Shikhaditto. So here is a, a small presentation on that. And now, uh, our secretary's message will be conveyed via video, virtually, uh, by Onindo. Onindo, please do the presentation of the video. Yes, please. I will move to the mother. I will move to the mother. I will Doctor Monica Chakraborty, who is my college student, who is our mother's contact center teacher, who is our dear student, hey Babu, she is our dear teacher, who is our dear teacher, who is our dear Babu, who is our dear teacher, who is our dear Babu, who is our dear teacher, who is our dear Babu, 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 who is our dear the Murisha to Tuna Lekapora Puti Chile, Amra, over the Pashi Thakbo. Amra to the Pashi Thakbo in Puti Chile, Ode Castigo, Puti Suti Chai, Jetunga, Porasuna Kurbe, Evon Paradita Chak in Nur, Jesh Homan, who was a teacher, Jesh Homan, Shita Tunga, Laka Sister Kurbe. Eight I Ode Katia, Result only 
Okay, thank you so much, uh, Anindo, uh, for that update. Okay, okay uh, now I'll, as part of the whole lecture uh, program, memorial lecture, I'll uh, now ask uh, Dr. Anirban Banerjee to kindly introduce Dr. Prem Kumar Agarwal. Sir, your part now. I thank Parabhita Chachakarindu for giving me this opportunity. I pay my respects to Professor Bhaskar Chattopadhyay and his wife, Kunika Chattopadhyay. And now I will present our guest speaker, Dr. Prem Kumar Agarwal. Dr. Prem Kumar Agarwal, I, firstly I thank him for agreeing to uh, deliver the lecture and I now present his credentials. Dr. Prem Kumar Agarwal is an alumnus of St. Xavier School and College. He pursued his LLM, LLB, LLM and PhD from the University of Badwan, West Bengal. He is a found, former judge and he was a founding faculty member of West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. Dr. Agarwal is presently serving as the head of the PG department of the law, Hugli Mohsin College. Dr. Agarwal visited Sweden in 1997 as a cultural ambassador and delivered a series of lectures on culture, polity and legal system of India under the prestigious group study exchange program of Rotary International. Dr. Agarwal is Editor-in-Chief of Global Journal of Juridical Sciences. Books authored by Dr. Agarwal include 1. Law of Limitation and Prescription Two, intellectual property rights of farmers. Three, drafting, pleading, and convincing. Four, company law, decoding the code. Five, cases and materials on the law of limitation and prescription. Six, law of adoption. Seven, empowerment of women. So, thank you for the generous introduction, uh, Hi, one. Professor uh, Oriban. Uh, Chakravarti and I commend the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts both as a social scientist and as a jurisprudential scientist on this important area which I am sure would be very close to the heart of Professor Vaskar Chattopadhyay on in whose memory 
this talk is being held because i also had the opportunity to interact with that great human being that great scholar oh quite a quite a few times so without further ado let me get into the topic nature of property so a brief introduction of property property can be of these uh, four types movable immovable tangible intangible tangible property is that property which can be felt by the senses the real property property can be movable immovable these are understandable tangible intangible tangible property is those properties which can be you know felt by your senses like you no know, land bullion currency all those things gold silver but intangible property are properties which cannot be felt by the five senses but have got economic value like patent copyright goodwill trademark all these are intangible properties now property can be acquired or acquisitioned by the following may, way by operation of law so by operation of law property can be acquired by inheritance or by will and through my talk i will be speaking of testamentary and intestate succession so to uh, familiarize non law audience with testamentary and intestate succession inheritance is test non intestate succession intestate means when a person dies without making a will then the that succession is known as intestate succession but if a person dies after making a will it is called testamentary succession it can also be acquired by contract and by contract it can be self acquired or gifted now scope the right to property includes which are those rights right to own right to possess right to enjoy right to alienate alienate means to transfer right to dispose of without you know transferring ownership it can be uh, licensed it can be leased all those things now history of right to property for the sake of constitutionality of the right to property i have divided this era in pre 44th amendment of the constitution and post 44th amendment in our constitution prop right to property was originally a fundamental right as enshrined in article 191f and article 31 but later on when this land reform thing came up and we went in a big way for economic justice we had to shift right with this right to property from fundamental right to a constitutional right and that was done by the 44th amendment and that was required because fund, if property right to property was a fundamental right it was becoming a stumbling block for implementation of this land reforms legislation which were absolutely required for the economic justice to be meted out to the people then right to property whether human right or not being human right every person irrespective of other discrimination has the equal right to acquire property however the proposition right to property is human right still stands as an oral concept in some arena one of the reasons of the same is that in india we do not have uniform civil code so property can be acquired by various means considering the context the significant sources of property are inheritance and self acquired and the law of inheritance along with gifts and will are governed by personal laws in india thus it differs from religion to religion so in india we cannot say that it has evolved to the stage of human rights now women's property right the key provisions of various personal laws will be referred here in after in order to comprehend women's right to property in india we must all appreciate that in india we do not have a uniform civil code unlike 
the uniform criminal code for the non law audience let me clarify it a little bit irrespective of whether you are a hindu muslim parsi jain sikh isai whatever you are if you commit a crime the same law regulates the trial that is the indian penal code the criminal procedure code and the evidence act but when the law relating to property comes or civil civil law we have separate laws for separate Uh, 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 separate pe- separate ki- types of or kinds of people it it depends on personal laws so a hindu is governed by hindu law a muslim is governed by muslim law a christian is governed by his own christian law parsi is governed by parsi law so when we go for a discourse on women's right to property in india we will have to do it under discrete heads of the right to property of women in muslim law right to property of women in hindu law and the like so let us first start with women's right to property under muslim law getting to property it is a prerequisite to have some light on the fundamentals of the same law that is the muslim law the main schools of thought of muslim law which are predominantly prevalent in india are the shia and the sunni the maximum muslim population in india belongs to hanafi school that is sub school of sunni law and few from itna asari that is sub school of shia law in india the greater portion of muslim personal law is not codified and it directly comes from the quran the holy book of the religion the law relating to the property is governed by the muslim personal law which is evident from the language of section 2 of the muslim personal law shariat act 1937 which says and i quote notwithstanding any custom or usage to the contrary in all questions save questions relating to agricultural land regarding in intested succession intested i already explained special property of females including personal property inherited or obtained under contract or gift or any other provision of personal law marriage dissolution of marriage including talaq ila zihar liya khula mubarak maintenance dower guardianship gifts trusts and trust properties and wakfs other than charities and charitable institutions and charitable and religious endowments the rule of decision in cases where the parties are muslims shall be the muslim personal law that is the sharia this gives credibility or credence to Muslim law as the law which governs the Muslims in India. Now, under Muslim personal law, the women's right to property is enshrined through the following modes: succession, dower, maintenance, and gift. Succession: when a person dies, the property is inherited by his heirs. It may be intestate succession or testamentary succession. Succession is the process by which earthly property of a person after his demise flows to the legal heirs of that person it may be intestate or testamentary unlike hindu law there is no distinction between self acquired property and ancestral property in india and such only on the death of the ancestor thus all his property irrespective of self acquired or ancestral can be inherited by successors only after the death of that person the doctrine of survivorship as is there in hindu law is not recognized under muslim law because the share of all the legal heirs are definite by virtue of the quran let me share something very interesting about muslim law with our non law audience see it is often a prejudice in the mind of people that women are discriminated against and are sort of not treated well in muslims or in islam but you will be amazed to know the islamic system of law was the only law which had a share of property inherit in inheritance for women even hindu law did not have a share of property for women in the early stages but then the discrimination with their male counterpart is there now let us discuss 
in pre islamic period females were excluded from the law of inheritance nevertheless since the islamic period females were made competent to be legal heirs of the ancestor and the shares were made definite daughters as a rule are entitled to inheritance however sometimes they are excluded from the inheritance by custom or statute for example gujars exclude daughters from the inheritance through custom in punjab and jammu and kashmir hanafi school of law this is the most dominant school of law which regulates uh, the law relating to muslim, uh, muslim law in india the customary heirs and the quranic heirs both takes the share from the property so who are quranic heirs and who are customary heirs quran lays down the holy book of the muslims lay down a fixed share for the heirs these are known as quranic heirs but then the entire property is not distributed amongst the heirs there is a fixed fraction the residue which remains goes to the customary heirs so the rule to prefer agnates over cognates now what is agnate and cognate agnates means when you relate through the father's side and cognate means when you relate through the mother's side so however a portion is taken and given to the quranic shareholders by recognizing the female agnates the quranic share carries forward the rule of agnates preference so agnates are preferred over cognates therefore if there is one female agnate and male agnate then by virtue of nearness of her claim to take a share in the estate of the deceased share and this does not deprive the male agnate from taking their customary residue share residuary share thus the male takes twice the share of the female now this is the discrimination which we will find throughout islamic law that the male counterpart gets twice what the female gets in another case so it will uh, the nearness in relation will uh, will be preferred a glimpse of few female sharers and their quranic shares now this inheritance amongst muslims is a very complex thing but it is very scientific now it will take a very long time to you know elaborate on that but just to give some food for thought of how the share of women are fixed and ensured in inheritance i will just discuss a little bit see the if a male muslim dies then if the heir is a wife and you know in muslim polygamy is permitted so if there is one wife she gets 1/8 of the share this is the quranic share it is mentioned in the quran fixed share if there are more than one wife that is two or more wives they also get 1/8 now how and when share gets affected when there is no child or child of son the share is increased to 1/4 so if the wife who is inheriting the property of the deceased husband if she has a child if she doesn't have a child or child of a son that is a son of his son or uh, uh, yeah then uh, the share is increased to 1/4 or if she is alone then the if if there is no child then she gets 1/4 or else she gets 1/8 daughter if there is one daughter she gets half as the quranic share but when there is a son the daughter becomes residuary and she gets 2/3 so here also you will find the discrimination son's daughter she gets half but if when one higher son's daughter is there it gets reduced to 1/8 and if there are more than one daughter they get 2/3 full sister she also gets half but then when there are more than one full sister they get 2/3 where there is a full brother she becomes a residuary so again brother also gets twice than the sister now in itna sari school of law this is a shia school very few number of shia muslims are there in this country 
This school does not recognize the agnet preference rule or prior rights of males over females. Under this rule, the property of the deceased devolves on the blood relations equally, although they although they take part strifes amongst themselves, except husband and wife. The females are allotted half the share allotted to the male in each grade. Shia school of law recognizes sharers and their residuaries. The blood relations not sharers are residuaries. Now a glimpse of few female sharers and their share in Ithna Asari school, that is the Shias. If the heir is the wife, if there is only one wife, she gets one sixth. If there are more than one wife, they get one eighth. And if there is no lineal descendant, see the share becomes one fourth. Mother gets one sixth, except where there is a lineal descendant or two or more full or consanguine brothers or other such brothers with two sisters, the, she takes one third. Daughter gets half. If there is more than one daughter, two third. If there is son, she becomes residuary with the son. Full sister again half. She becomes residuary when there is a full brother and father. Now, that was the right to property of the Muslim women under the Muslim inheritance law especially relating to inheritance that is from succession the two things which are very prominent in Muslim inheritance law is there is a fixed share for the daughter for the women but then there is a discrimination between the male and the female in that the son gets twice what the daughter gets now let us come to dower or meher this is also a kind of property in Muslim law there is a system of meher or dower which is known as consideration for marriage or cohabitation. It is a sort of a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo means a trade off, something in return of something. So dower or meher is a sum of money paid by the husband to the wife as a consideration for cohabitation. According to Mullah, dower is a sum of money or other property which the wife is entitled to receive from the husband in consideration of marriage. The amount or any other property payable is generally fixed by the parties, otherwise the court fixes it. The interesting fact about the dower is the right to dower cannot be waived. Even if the wife waives to receive the property, such waiver is deemed to be void. Dower cannot justify the amount payable after divorce. It is the consideration of marriage and not the divorce. So even if a woman says that I don't need dower, she cannot do so. So dower is the consideration for marriage. Dower can be meheri tafwiz, fixed by mutual consent after the marriage. Meheri takim, fixed by the court. Proper, that is fixed by operation of law, proper dower. Specified, fixed by mutual agreement of the parties, which can be of further two kinds, prompt dower and deferred dower. There is no maximum amount fixed for purpose of dower except Hanafis and Malikis, which are 10 and 3 dirhams respectively. However, in proper dower, the Shias has specified that dower cannot be more than 500 dirhams. The wife has the power to recover the dower on confirmation either by an actionable claim or an unsecured debt or retaining the husband's property in case of in case his marriage has been dissolved by death or divorce. Now maintenance. The right to maintenance although is not directly related to right to property but in the broader scope and ambition it is within right to property. The right to maintenance can be claimed by wife including widow, children and parents. We all know, even the non-law people know that there is a provision in the criminal procedure code section 125 which enables a woman and since CRPC is a secular law it is applicable to all women cutting across religion irrespective of whether she is a Muslim 
Hindu, Parsi, Christian, whatever. And those who uh, 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 keep track of uh, events must be aware that there was an uproar in the country when, when the Supreme Court in Sabanu's case declared that even Muslim wives are entitled to maintenance under section 125 of the CRPC on the precise logic that the legislature had inserted section 125 in CRPC to make use of a uniform criminal code in the absence of a uniform civil code and to use the coercive machinery to ensure the economic right of an estranged woman as a wife and wife includes a divorced wife but then we all know that due to protest by the muslim law board that then rajiv gandhi government came with another law known as the muslim women protection of rights on divorce act 1986 which laid down that the muslim wife is entitled to fair and reasonable maintenance within the to be paid within the iddat period iddat period means that after divorce she needs to be maintained only for the three menstrual cycles that is only three months and so the Muslim uh, law board was very happy with this law but off late a very interesting thing has happened and our apex court uh, through the Bombay High Court first the case came before the Bombay High Court and ultimately it was affirmed by the Supreme Court has very creatively interpreted section 3 of the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act and the interpretation is as follows. What is fair and reasonable for an estranged lady? Any amount of maintenance which is enough for the rest of her life or she remarries has to be paid within the that period. So, for an example, she say a wife is divorced by the husband. You know, unilateral right of divorce is there in Muslim law for the husband against the wife. And if he pronounces divorce, say, to a 30-year-old woman and say a life expectancy 60 years. So, for the rest 30 years, say, for example, if she needs 5,000 rupees per month, say, for one year, 60,000 rupees. For 30 years, 60,000 for 30 years, 18 lakhs must be paid within three months. That was the brilliant interpretation attributed to Section 3 of this Act. And now the Muslim law board said it's better to be governed by Section 125 CRPC than to go under this law. And it was interpreted and shown by the court to be in consonance with the spirit of the Quran because in the Quran in a particular ayat it is written that the husband must ensure maintenance to the wife fair and reasonable to be arranged within this Iddat period. So that was in consonance with the spirit of the Quran and therefore they sort of the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act they don't prefer uh, this law now, they all uh, prefer to be governed by 125 CRPC. Now comes Hiba or gift. According to Amir Ali, a Hiba is a voluntary gift without consideration of property by one person to another as to constitute the doni, the property of the subject matter of the gift. Every Muslim person that is male, female, married, unmarried who has attained the age of majority and of sound mind is capable of being Hiba. Doni must be living at the time of making of the gift and there is no restriction and in regarding religion or sex. Although there is no limit to gift of the property, but the donor must hold the ownership of the said property. Thus, Muslim women can make the gift to anyone at her will and also have the capability of being a doni without any bar. Now, let us come to Hindu law and women's right to property. Women's right to property under Hindu law can be appreciated by the following approach. Concept of Stridhan, Succession and Maintenance. 
ownership in property of Hindu women pre 1956 era and post 1956 era. Why is this year 1956 so important? Because the Hindu Succession Act was enforced in 1956. It is the Hindu Succession Act 1956. Before that, we did not have a codified law, an enacted law on Hindu Succession Act. So pre 1965-56 Act, it was Sridhan absolute ownership, women's estate limited ownership. Post 1956, women will have the absolute ownership under section 14.1 except in a few cases under section 14.2. So pre-1956 era, Sridhan was absolute ownership of the women, limited estate was there which we will discuss shortly. Sridhan and women's estate. There is a dilemma before 1956 Act as to what constitutes Sridhan. However, the subschools of Mitakshara gave an enumeration of Sridhan which included gift and bequests from either the relatives or strangers, purchased property acquired by compromise in lieu of maintenance or property gained from adverse possession. Unlike Sridhan, in women estate, the Hindu female got the limited ownership. After the Hindu Succession Act 1956 came into force, all the diverged opinions Sridhan and was overshadowed by the provision of Section 14 of the Act. Sridhan is the actually absolute property of the woman, which she gets in the form of, you know, uh, marriage gifts or when she was born, all those gifts, they are Sridhan. In English law, there is a similar concept known as women's estate and it is often said, it is jokingly said in the courts that you can break the wrist of your wife but do not touch her wristwatch because that is her Sridhan. She has an absolute right over that property. So, section 14.1 reads as, any property possessed by a female Hindu whether acquired before or after the commencement of this act shall be held by her as full owner thereof and not as a limited owner. Thus the wider scope of the section while giving the perspective as well as the retros prospective as well as the retrospective effect that it converts all the women's estates property into Sridhan that is absolute ownership. Now what is the jurisprudential rationale of this section 14? However, this transform, I will come to that. However, this transformation is subject to two conditions. Ownership must be vested with her and she must be possessed of the property. It was decided in Radha versus Hanuman by the Supreme Court. If at the time of the commencement of the act, the property is not in the possession of Hindu female, section 14 will not be attracted and the old Hindu law will continue to apply. So if the property is in possession and if she is a woman, then there is no question of limited ownership, she is the absolute owner. Now, what is the background of section 14? We will come to know this by this slide. Interesting facts to note. Position of women, position of women estate after the widow remarriage. We all know about widow remarriage act. Section 2 of the Hindu widow remarriage act laid down that the rights and interest which the widow gets from certain property of her deceased husband was considered to be as limited estate and shall seize upon her remarriage and shall devolve as if she died. After the 1956 Act, it was held that by virtue of Section 14, the above mentioned limited ownership becomes the absolute ownership. So, since the Hindu Widow Remarriage Act did not allow absolute interest in property of a remarried widow, that was remedied by Section 14 of the 1956 Act. That if she is a woman and if the property is in her possession, then it is no more a limited estate, it is an absolute estate. So, that was 
and enhancement of the empowerment of the women as regards to right to property moreover the remarriage after commencement of the act would not dispossess her of the property limited ownership although the concept of limited ownership is being abolished through the act of 1956 itself it does not interfere with the law of contract and grants so if by contract or grant if she is granted limited ownership that will remain intested succession unlike muslim law the hindu women were not entitled to inherit the ancestral property till 2005 amendment of the hindu succession act 2005 amendment struck down the doctrine of survivorship we all must be must be uh, aware that this hindu succession act was amended in 2005 to give the daughters equal right with the sons for copartitionary property in hindu law a distinction is always drawn between ancestral property and self acquired property before the amendment of 2005 the daughters were not copartitioners in the ancestral property of the family but after the 2005 act they are just like the sons they are also copartitioners in the property so huf or hindu undivided family now consists of both male copartitioners and female copartitioners but then of late the controversy regarding this was whether this amendment of 2005 is applicable prospectively or retrospectively the amendment was enacted on 9 september 2005 the amendment was done to remove the discrepancy persistent in the act however it has no, it has not clarified some significant aspect and the difficulty was the main issue whether the father is required to be alive on 9 september 2005 in order to be copartitioner of the father's property the dilemma continued till august 2020 now let us go through briefly some of the judicial decisions in which the supreme court threw some light on whether this amendment would be prospective or retrospective prakash versus fulwati and others in 2016 supreme court laid down that it is a prerequisite that the father should be alive on 9 september 2005 again in danamma versus amar and others in 2018 supreme court said father not being alive on this date does not deprive the daughter of his right to property recently 2020 vinita sharma versus rakesh sharma the supreme court has held the right of the woman to be copartitioner is granted by virtue of birth so the determining factor or test should not be the father being alive so this decision vinita vs sharma vs rakesh sharma opens flood gates for innumerable number of litigations say partitions which has already which are already over will now be sought to be reopened by instituting suits by say pcs and grant pcs by coming to claim their share of the property so there will be flood gates of litigation by this judgment we all know for the non law audience i am saying whatever is declared by the supreme court is the law of the land according to article 142 of the constitution so this decision will now open flood gates of litigation testamentary succession in testamentary succession the testator has the freedom to dispose of property according to his choice that is when you die after making a will it is called testamentary succession ancestral property cannot be bequeathed through testamentary succession only self acquired property is within its ambit there is no discrimination with regard to testator and acceptor testamentary succession is governed through the indian succession act so all women can dispose of their property by making will now maintenance any hindu female can uh, is entitled to maintenance under the hindu marriage act 1955 adoption maintenance act 1956 code of criminal procedure section 125 we already discussed so these are the laws and the relevant provisions of the law under which we can claim maintenance under the hindu law daughter in law and in laws property right daughter in laws So under the Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act 2007 the in-laws have the right to evict daughters-in-law 
from their own property in case of family disputes. But then off late, due to this Domestic Violence Act 2005, daughter-in-laws can defend their right of residence in a shared household. This has been upheld in a plethora of cases by the Supreme Court. One of them is Sunil Batra and another versus Tarun Batra. But then what is shared property is not defined anywhere in the Domestic Violence Act. In the case of Bimala Ven Ajit Bhai Patel versus Vatsal Ven, Supreme Court held that the shared property does not include in-laws property which are exclusively owned by them. Now these are the various case laws in which this thing is now being deliberated upon but this is a welcome move that no woman can now be dispossessed from the shared household under the Domestic Violence Act. So that is a very important empowerment of women under this law. Now let us come to the Christian law. The Christian women's right to property can be realized through the Indian Succession Act, which is a secular law, the Special Marriage Act, Indian Divorce Act and Code of Criminal Procedure, Section 125. Now, these are the relevant provisions under Indian Succession Act, which deal with Christian women's right to property, the non-Parsis, that means Christians. The Indian Christian widow's right is not an exclusive right and gets curtailed as the other heirs step in. Only if the interstate has left none who are kindred to him, the whole of his property would belong to his widow. Where the interstate has left a widow and a lineal descendants, one third of his property devolves to his widow and the remaining two thirds goes to his lineal descendants. So if I say male Christian dying intestate, if he has left any lineal descendant, then the widow gets only one third. The two third goes to the other lineal descendants. But if he has left no lineal descendant but has left persons who are kindred to him, one half of the property goes to the window, widow and the remaining half goes to who are kindred to him. So even here there is a little discrimination with respect to women. Where intestate's father dead but his mother, brothers and sisters living. If the intestate's father is dead but the intestate's mother is living, and there are also brothers or sisters of the interstate living and there is no child living of any deceased brother or sister the mother and each living brother or sister shall succeed to the property in equal shares however the widow of a prince's son gets no share but the children whether born or in the womb at the time of the death would be entitled to equal shares maintenance both under special marriage act section 36 and 35 of the special marriage act 37 of the special marriage act under Indian Divorce Act 36, 32, 38 and 125 the CRPC, they are Christian women are entitled to maintenance. Now, women's right to property under Parsi law. Like any other religion, Parsis are also governed by their personal law. However, the succession is facilitated by the Indian Succession Act 1925. The maintenance of Parsi female are instructed through the Special Marriage Act 1954, Indian Divorce Act 1869 and Code of Criminal Procedure 1783. Now, succession and maintenance, the distinction is given. Now, let me conclude with these food for thought for our audience and listeners today. Law is the instrument of changing society. The concept reflects very well in today's discussion. Mm -hmm. Constantly it is changing according to the needs of the society and tries to improve. However, the law relating to property is not in consonance with the fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution. The preamble of the Constitution along with Article 14, 15 and 21 enables equality of status of all and every kinds of justice, economic, political, social, but that is not uh, observed in right to property vis-a-vis -vis male, female. But as the personal law has no matches with each, it becomes difficult to assure equality. The clash or conflict between personal laws and the fundamental rights is often observed and decided by the Honorable Supreme Court. It has been observed as the India have uniform, uniform criminal code. The provision of maintenance can be claimed under Section 125 CRPC, irrespective of sex, caste, race or religion. Therefore, it is the need of the hour to think about the implementation of Article 44 of the Constitution, which talks about uniform civil code. Now, whether uniform civil code will be the order of the day or not depends on the political will of our politicians. Let me end with this note that 
unless sincere effort without politicking the rule of social justice should not be made a tool of politicking by our revered politicians if that is done we will be able to give a meaningful social and economic justice to the women folk of this country unless that is done unless 44 remains article 44 of the constitution remains a wishful thinking and a tool of politics by our politicians this dream of economic justice for the women folk of this country will remain a dream it will never be a reality thank you for the opportunity given to me i would be glad to answer any questions if they are put to me thank you thank you so much prem uh, we will uh, take up the questions towards the end of the session okay no because problem. amrit has been uh, has been waiting for a long time it no is problem. now my great I... pleasure to actually introduce to all of uh, to all of you my uh, friend and uh, great mentor in a sense uh, dr amrit shen amrit shen is actually a professor of uh, english at vishwa bharati shantini ketan he is interested in 18th century studies travel writing tabor studies and the history of science he has won the outstanding research award for his doctoral dissertation called the narcissist mode metafiction as a strategy in mol flanders tom jones and tristram shandy which was published by worldview in 2007 he has recently jointly edited the centenary edition of gitanjali in 2012 and rabindranath tagore the unsung hero in 2013 both published by vishwa bharati he is also the secretary of vishwa bharati study circle the university's highest interdisciplinary academic forum and the joint editor of the vishwa bharati quarterly uh, that is only a part of amrit of course um, but ladies and gentlemen we now hear dr amrit shen and his lecture amrit please right uh, with your permission shomitra uh, i would like to speak the bulk of my lecture in bangla if that is all okay with all of you yes 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 perfectly okay i think we have got right. a very large bangla audience over here okay no right. problem acha acha prothome ami amar shraddha janai অধ্যাপক ভাস্কর চট্টোপাধ্যায় ও শ্রীমতী চট্টোপাধ্যায় স্মৃতির উদ্দেশ্যে এবং ধন্যবাদ জানাই অনির্বাণ বাবু সৌমিত্র ডক্টর প্রেম কুমার আগরওয়াল যিনি এত সুন্দর করে আমার আগে বলে গেলেন বিশেষ করে আইনের জটিল জায়গাগুলোকে সহজ করে দিলেন তাদেরকে আমি আজকে যে ছোট বক্তব্য রাখবো সেটি রবীন্দ্রনাথের এবং ঠাকুরবাড়ির চিন্তায় মেয়েদের সম্পত্তির অধিকার এই প্রসঙ্গে এবং এই প্রসঙ্গে আমি বলতে চাইব এইটাই যে রবীন্দ্রনাথ মেয়েদের সম্পর্কে যে চিন্তাভাবনা করে গেছেন তা বহুল চর্চিত সেখানে আমার নতুন করে আলাদা কথা বলার জায়গা খুব একটা নেই কিন্তু সৌমিত্র যখন আমাকে এই বক্তৃতার কথাটুকু বলে তখন আমার মনে হয় একটা নতুন গবেষণা একটু দেখা দরকার যে ঠিক ঠাকুর বাড়িতে মেয়েদের সম্পত্তির অধিকার কিভাবে বিভিন্ন সময় দেওয়া হয়েছে এবং সেই হিসেবে আমি দুই ঠাকুরের দেবেন্দ্রনাথ এবং রবীন্দ্রনাথ তাদের উইলগুলো একটু দেখতে চেষ্টা করি এবং প্রথমেই আমি সেই কারণে এই সময় বিশ্বভারতী বন্ধ তবু আমার রবীন্দ্র ভবনের সতীর্থরা বিশেষ করে শোভন এবং শাশ্বতী দুজনে আমাকে পড়ে শুনিয়েছেন আমি বর্তমানে গ্রন্থন বিভাগে আছি সুতরাং আমি নিজের চোখে এগুলো দেখতে পারিনি পারলে হয়তো আমি একটু প্রজেক্ট করে দেখাতে পারতাম আমার প্রতিপাদ্য বিষয় দুটো অভিমুখের মধ্যে দিয়ে চলবে এক ঠাকুরবাড়ি যেটি বলা হয় আধুনিক ভারতবর্ষে নারী স্বাধীনতার অন্যতম পীঠস্থান সেখানে মেয়েদের সম্পত্তির অধিকার ঠিক কিরকম ছিল এটা হচ্ছে প্রথম অভিমুখ আমার দ্বিতীয় অভিমুখ ব্যক্তি রবীন্দ্রনাথ লেখক রবীন্দ্রনাথ মেয়েদের সম্পত্তির অধিকারের কথা ঠিক কিভাবে বলেছেন অর্থাৎ আমি কিন্তু বহুল চর্চিত 
নারী স্বাধীনতা নারীর অধিকার ব্যক্তি স্বাধীনতা এর কথা বিশেষ বলবো না কারণ আমার যারা দর্শক রয়েছেন এবং শ্রোতা রয়েছেন বিশেষ করে যারা বিদগ্ধ তারা তো এ ব্যাপারে অনেকটাই জানে আমি প্রথমেই শুরু করি ঠাকুরবাড়ির প্রথম আইনত জটিলতা নিয়ে বিশেষ করে দ্বারকানাথের মৃত্যুর পরে আমরা জানি যে ঠাকুরবাড়ি এই সময় উঠে আসছে স্বাধীনতার আগে ভারতবর্ষের অন্যতম নারী স্বাধীনতার জায়গা হিসেবে যদিও দ্বারকানাথ সেই অর্থে এবং দ্বারকানাথের পত্নী তো দ্বারকানাথের সম্পর্কে অত্যন্ত বিতশ্রদ্ধ ছিলেন এইভাবে যে তিনি সেবা যত্ন করে গেছেন কিন্তু যতবার দ্বারকানাথের সঙ্গে কথা বলেছেন ততবার তিনি নিজে গঙ্গা গঙ্গা জলে স্নান করেছেন অর্থাৎ দ্বারকানাথের এই ইংরেজি যেটাকে বলা যেতে পারে বৈভব এবং তার লাইফস্টাইল তিনি মোটেই পছন্দ করেন কিন্তু দ্বারকানাথের মৃত্যুর পরে আমরা দেখতে পাই যে ত্রিপুরা সুন্দরী দেবী যিনি নগেন্দ্রনাথের স্ত্রী তিনি কিন্তু দেবেন্দ্রনাথের বিরুদ্ধে মামলা ঠুকছেন কেন না মাত্র দুশো টাকা মাসোহারা তার জন্য নির্ধারিত করা হয় ডক্টর আগরওয়াল একটু আগে এই মাসোহারার কথাটা বলছিলেন এবং কিভাবে ইন্টেস্টেড মারা যান দেব দ্বারকানাথ যার ফলে এই সমস্যাগুলি তৈরি হয় ত্রিপুরা সুন্দরী কিন্তু পরিবারের এক তৃতীয়াংশ সম্পত্তির অধিকার দাবি করেন এবং আগরওয়াল সাহেব যে কথাটা বলে গেলেন একটু আগে যে সেই সময়ের আইন কিন্তু গভীরভাবে পিতৃতান্ত্রিক অর্থাৎ মেয়েদের সম্পত্তির অধিকার স্ত্রীধন ব্যতীত খুব অল্পই ছিল দেখা যাচ্ছে যে কেদার মজুমদারের পরামর্শে তিনি দুশো টাকা মাসো হারার বিরুদ্ধে মামলা করেন এবং দেবেন্দ্রনাথের মধ্যে আমরা এক বৈপরীত্য লক্ষ্য করি একদিকে ঘোরতর বিষয়ী মানুষ আবার অন্যদিকে ঘোরতর ধার্মিক দেবেন্দ্রনাথের সঙ্গে এই মামলা বেশ কিছুদিন চলে পরে অবশ্য দেবেন্দ্রনাথ মামলা মিটিয়ে নেন এবং হাজার টাকা মাসোহারা পান ত্রিপুরা সুন্দরী দেবী এবং সার্কুলার রোডে জোড়া গির্জার দুটি বাড়ি তার নামে লিখে দিতে হয় অর্থাৎ দেখা যাচ্ছে যে ঠাকুরবাড়ির অন্দরমহলের মহিলাদের মধ্যে ত্রিপুরা সুন্দরী কিন্তু একজন ব্যতিক্রম যিনি এই মামলা লড়েন এবং সফলভাবে লড়েন এবং নিজের অধিকার খানিকটা হলেও কায়েম করতে সক্ষম হন এটা হচ্ছে আমার প্রথম পর্বের প্রথম অংশ ত্রিপুরা সুন্দরী কিন্তু দেবেন্দ্রনাথের পরিবারকে বিশ্বাস করতেন না অর্থাৎ তার পরিবারের তিনি যখন দেখা করতে আসতেন তখন অন্য জল পর্যন্ত গ্রহণ করেননি এবার আসা যাক দেবেন্দ্রনাথের কথা দেবেন্দ্রনাথ ঠাকুর আপনার সকলেই জানেন ব্রাহ্ম সমাজের অন্যতম কর্ণধার দেবেন্দ্রনাথের আমলেই কিন্তু নারী স্বাধীনতার একটা বাতাবরণ যেন ঠাকুর বাড়িতে শুরু হয়েছিল যদিও বলা যায় যে তার জনক সেই অর্থে ছিলেন সত্যেন্দ্রনাথ তবু দেবেন্দ্রনাথ ঠাকুর আঠেরোশো নিরানব্বই সালে একটি ডিড করেন এবং মারা যাওয়ার পরে তার উইল আমরা লক্ষ্য করতে পারি দেবেন্দ্রনাথ ঠিক কিভাবে সম্পত্তি ভাগ বাটোয়ারা করেছিলেন সাম আপ হোয়াট আই হ্যাড সেট দ্যাট ইউ নো মাই লেকচার ইজ ইন টু পার্টস ইন দ্য ফার্স্ট পার্ট আই টক অ্যাবাউট দ্য প্র্যাকটিস অফ অ্যাকচুয়াল উইমেন্স প্রপার্টি রাইটস ইন দ্য টেগোর হাউস how it was practiced and rabindranath gets putishor and you will find therefore that the bulk of rabindranath's rural reconstruction program therefore is centered around putishor shilaidaho is no longer really the place where he can later on experiment it is interesting that jyotirindranath gets 1250 rupees a month as maintenance hemendranath the other brother gets Pandua, which is probably Orissa and therefore the remotest of the Tagore households, uh, uh, Tagore estates, I'm sorry. 
Now, very interestingly, uh, the brother who had lost his life, who was uh, who who was mad, who was insane, Bilendranath, had a son, Bolendranath, who is but by this time dead. So it's very interesting in the way that later on, when Bolendranath dies, I'm sorry, Bolendranath establishes the Brahmacharjas from school. So it is from him that, you know, the school which becomes the kernel of Vishwa Bharati actually starts. Bolendranath dies and his widow, Shahana Devi, and Birendranath, so his mother is also widowed, Profullomoy, get 100 rupees as maintenance each. Therefore, the widow and the widowed in law, daughter in law, widowed daughter in law, get just 100 rupees a month as maintenance. Interestingly, Shodamini, who is the eldest daughter of Devendranath, gets to live in one part of the house, but he does, she does not get any share of the property. Rabindranath's elder sister also, Borno Kumari Devi, gets a maintenance of 100 rupees a month. Very interesting in the sense that in 1936, Borno Kumari Devi, 1936, this is the fag end of Tagore's life, by the way. Borno Kumari files a case against Rabindranath and the other Tagores, saying that she has not received this amount for several years. And Rabindranath writes that we have forgotten to give her her, uh, her inheritance in that sense of the term, uh, her, her maintenance, and therefore let us settle the case. The case is settled. But the fact remains that Borno Kumari Devi, 1936, has filed a case against the Tagores again. Now, the case becomes even more complicated with Profullomoi Devi. Profullomoi, who is, remember, the widowed uh, widow of, uh, of Birindranath and the widowed mother-in-law of the widowed Shahana Devi actually wants her daughter-in-law to be educated. Shahana Devi was from Allahabad and Shahana Devi goes back to Allahabad where during this period her father wants her to be married once again as a widow. So widow remarriage. In 1900, Devendranath actually sends Rabindranath to Allahabad to persuade Shahana Devi that she should not marry. She should not enter into a remarriage. And Shahana Devi by this time is in the Parda. Shahana Devi relents. Profullamoyi wanted her daughter-in-law to go to get educated in science and to go abroad for an education, both of which are refused. It's a paradox, therefore, isn't it? That the Tagore that we know, the Rabindranath that we know, the Devendranath, of course, being the great patriarch, but the Rabindranath that we know actually intervenes in a very patriarchal mode and accepts and continues the tradition of the women's property rights and in fact denies agency to this woman who is younger to her, who is, you know, whose mother-in-law in fact uh, has asked for her edu uh, education abroad and denies modernity to her. Therefore, it's a strange coincidence in the sense that the Tagore who in 1878, in his first travelogue called Europe Probashin Potro, uh, the, uh, the letters from a sojourner to Europe, that's the translation, had actually quarreled with his elder brother, saying that women should have a greater agency and independence. And this entire debate between elder brother and younger brother was carried in the pages of the Bharati, takes a complete U-turn in denying any modernity or any scope of relief to a widow. In fact, Profullomoy will come back later on only 
she she goes away stays in ironically what is described as a muslim area with only one help and she becomes almost a sage ascetic and will come back only when tagore is very ill during his last week uh, illnesses but that's not the point the point therefore remains that despite the tagore household being as it were one of the bastions of female independence will remember ganodanandini will remember uh, shotendranath who takes his wife to parties who takes his wife abroad and whose daughter is brought up in the most open circumstances robindranath actually participates in almost an extreme patriarchal move was it because of this guilt that robindranath carried that later on he would marry his son rothindranath to a widow that's that's an interesting question to ponder i'm sure somebody as sensitive as robindranath would have probably hesitated at his father's decision although as long as maharshi was alive it was very difficult for robindranath to defer uh, to to sort of differ with him he had to defer to him actually now having made this case let me quickly take a look at the first will that robindranath makes now by this time robindranath has of course married off most of his daughters this 1911 now it's interesting also and all of you are aware of this especially my friends uh from in and around bengal that robindranath himself wrote against the system of dowry and dowry being you know a version of the stree dhon which is actually handed over to the husband now uh madhuri lata is married off his eldest daughter 14 years 8 months to sharad kumar who is the son of bihari lal and the dowry is asked the dowry asked is 20000 to go haggles and settles for 10000 later on pays 2000 more renuka is married off 10 years 8 months to shotendranath patacharya meera devi atushibala was her proper name married off at 14 years 6 months to nagin ganguli uh, all the three sons are supposedly robindranath sponsors their trip to uh, a trip abroad nagindranath ganguli the the last uh, son in law is of course uh, the worst of them all and in 1920 meera actually divorces her uh, her husband and robindranath writes that i have destroyed her life on the wedding night a cobra had raised its hood i wish it had bitten my daughter can you sense the pain of the father who's writing this at this point of time but my point remembers uh, uh, remind uh, i'm sorry my point being that the tagore whom we see liberal in his writings when it comes to his own daughters and their rights is extremely conservative where there what about the other women in the tagore households let's just take the case of indira devi indira devi is married at 26 years after a period of courtship to a man who is just a few years senior to her so within the tagore household i'm say, suggesting that there is a wind of change but paradoxically the author who's written so much about the plight of women when it comes to his own daughters and their agency is extremely limited interestingly how about that will the will is dated 2nd of posh 1314 of the bengali calendar this is 1911 the witnesses are shotto prasad gangopadhyay and gopal chattopadhyay and rovindranath says that his daughters will get a maintenance of 50 rupees each and meera will get a allowance of 100 rupees in case they are widowed this 
maintenance will be doubled so they will get 100 rupees each and the entire property goes to Rothindranath along with the Bolpur school please remember that there's no Bishwabharati at this point of time in fact it is the school of Pato Bhavan which Rabindranath is running and he gives Rothindranath entire agency to run the school as he pleases. Rabindranath will of course later on amend this and give the entire property to Vishwabharati and the trust of Vishwabharati which will run the institution. But even then Rabindranath does not provide anything for Meera and Meera Devi in her memoir writes about the fact that she has to live all alone in Malancho almost unprovided for. Therefore, in terms of property rights, we see a strange Rabindranath who is extremely patriarchal, a Rabindranath who has broken the shackles in other aspects, but who does not really differ from Devendranath in the treatment of women's property rights specifically. This is my first point. Now, I edited a book on the women of Shantiniketan at one point of time. It was called Sharing the Dream. And I noticed something very interesting about the educationist Rabindranath. It's also interesting that Rabindranath did not start women's education in and around Bolpur. It was started by the Bolpur Girls School even earlier. So even the educationist Rabindranath is not a pioneer in terms of introducing women's education at Shantiniketan. It was largely done to cater to the girls of the staff at Shantiniketan. And it's very interesting that one of the leading uh, initiatives was taken by Kiron Balashen, who was one of uh, the grandmother of uh, Amur Toshen, actually. Now, my point being here, of course, that later on, Rabindranath will amend this and will initiate not only the education of women, but also, you know, introducing women to the stage. In fact, Gauri Bhanjar writes about Rabindranath actually dancing up to the stage so that, you know, uh, at that point of time, women dancing on the stage would have been prohibited as vulgar and therefore Rabindranath sanctified that performance with his own presentation. So by the 1920s, we are looking at a slightly different Rabindranath. But the early Rabindranath, I, I wouldn't say the early Rabindranath in 1911, he's 49, uh, he's 50 years old almost, is still extremely patriarchal. So this is a dichotomy in terms of women's property rights that I note. Now, I promise to show me through, I would not give a very long uh, lecture, but I have two or three points to make. Now, in 1925, incidentally, Rabindranath writes an essay in the Vishwabharati quarterly called The Indian Ideal of Marriage. Now, this is an interesting essay in the sense that it talks about what the ideal of marriage and the role of the wife in society is. Rabindranath makes a very important point. He says that the home of Europe is not the home of India, that in India the home is part of the greater community, that the Otithi is as much part of our culture as the people at home and therefore the sense of property in Europe and the sense of property in India is not the same. And therefore, he's not arguing for a marriage which is based on desire, but a marriage which is based on a sense of control and a sense of sacrifice. And it is therefore that he says that the wife should not only think of the husband as a person, but the husband as an idea. Again, quite deeply patriarchal. And it is therefore he says that the property rights, that is my point, the property rights of the woman and the man, therefore, are fluid. And therefore, it is in the sacrifice of the property rights that the Indian ideal of marriage remains. 
almost a justification of the denial of property rights given to women. In fact, the one example that he is using is that of Shokuntala, who, uh, when he, she commits an act of desire with Dushanto, is punished. But it is in the spirituality of raising the son, and uh, that is her, her own son, and it is in this uh, role that Shokuntala is, as it were, redeemed. And therefore, Rabindranath sees women's role as placid and therefore women as not, you know, whatever independence is not despite the home, but within or from the home itself. As I keep on saying, Rabindranath's ideas are evolutionary, not revolutionary, but when it comes to this essay, I find it slightly disturbing to say the least. Now, the other point that I wanted to make was the property rights in his stories. Now, this I will do so with three short stories of Rabindranath, because it is here that I find a few examples. The first is that the story called Rashbonir Chile, where interestingly, we find that the widow of Abhayacharan, Rajasundari, is fooled by Shamacharan and his sons after Shamacharan's death, of course. They see that the son has been, uh, uh, that Rajasundari's son has been uh, denied, and the story goes on. So, therefore, there's the suggestion that the woman has not only no property rights in that sense of the term, but she's also unwise or unaware, let's not call it un unwise, but unaware in terms of a property rights. Now, this is a recurrent theme in many of the short stories as well. Therefore, the woman lacks legal agency, as it were. The second story, of course, is directly different. And this is a story which is Onodikar Pravesh, where we have Joykali, the widow, who looks after the property of uh, her husband. Now, the Bengali words which are used here are Dhiro Shori, robust, Tikno Nasha, a very sharp nosed, Prukhar Buddhi. So, worldly wise, deeply intelligent, and who is legally extremely aware, aware of retaining her property and maintaining every pie and pies. Now, the story is about a Madhavilata flower uh, podium, as it were, which is disturbed by her, her nephew, whom she thrashes because of this. But a little later, a pig actually steps into it, destroys it in fear of being pursued by uh, the domes. And this woman, Joy Kali, property wise aware, prevents the domes, saying that there's no pig in this household and allows what is supposedly a defilement of the mandir of Radhanath Jiu. This is an interesting story, isn't it? Not only do we have a diametrically different woman here, a widow who is extremely conscious of her property rights, retains her property, but with this legal awareness comes a modernity within this woman as well, Adhunikata, where she can cast off not only her identity as an unaware, legally, uh, let us say, unwise widowed woman, takes on a new garb, and in this modern avatar, she radically contests the caste and religious aspersions of traditional Hindu beliefs. And I can't but quote a few lines in Bengali, which I'll translate for my uh, friends who do not know Bengali, but this Bengali is so brilliant that I cannot but resist 
uttering these lines, Nikhil Jagotev's Shorbojibir Mahadevota, Porum Prashanno Hoyo, Kitu Kudro Pollid, Shomaj Namdhari Oti Kudro Devotati, Niroti Shoy, Shankub the Hoyauti. That is to say, the greater God of man actually was happy, whereas, was pleased rather, whereas the, the lesser social being was extremely displeased with this gesture of the woman. Now, this is where I would suggest we have glimpses of Rabindranath's idea of the Shabala. Now, this idea I'll come to in a moment when I conclude. But the third story which I would like to talk about is laboratory, where we find Nando Kishore, an iconoclastic practitioner of science who earns money through industry, unlike the Bengali gentleman who would largely be a clerk. And he chooses as his partner, somebody, a, a Punjabi woman called Shohin and leaves his laboratory to Shohini so that she can actually find a justified successor for him. And Shohini, of course, has this daughter Neela and he chooses Revati, who falls into the trap of, uh, you know, a life of extravagance and therefore tries to find a legal loophole through which they can take hold of the property Neela and Revati. And Shoini, of course, sort of exposes the fact that Neela is not uh, Nandu Kishore's son and that she will remain the custodian of the laboratory and dismisses Rebati from this, uh, from this space, as it were. Now, Rebati and Neela are not my points here. My point is the existence of Shohini as this new woman, the widow who sort of not only accepts the legal uh, let's say challenge of Nandukishur's estate, but actually becomes the custodian of his legacy. Now, uh, Dr. Agawal was referring to, you know, this concept of the property in terms of tangible and intangible. So the laboratory is both a tangible property as well as an intangible asset in the sense that it is also the dream of the husband which is not simply a laboratory, but also the legacy that she becomes a custodian of. So in that sense, it's not only we talking of property rights that we are here, we are talking also about, you know, a deeper right of carrying on a modern legacy, a legacy of modernism, whereby the woman becomes, you know, the carrier of that modern legacy. So I find these three stories interesting in the sense that Rabindranath in at least two of them is talking about a diametrically different woman, you know, who is in that sense, robust, strong, very characteristically, all of these women are masculine in the sense that they, they are, uh, they, they, they have a, have a degree of strength. Uh, interestingly, of course, the text, text that most of you are thinking about also at this point of time is uh, Chitrangada, which of course I will not talk about because all of you know about it. And when Chitrangada, of course, says that I am a woman, right? I am the queen, right? And the daughter of a queen, right? Rajendranandi. And then exposes herself not just as a mother or as a lover but in her bare existence as the woman. Now, this new woman whom Ravindranath will refer to in a poem in Mohua called Shabala. Now, I had actually planned this lecture in Bangla, so uh, I had not, I do not have a ready translation. I will translate as I go along. But I'd like to read two brief stanzas of this poem for my audience. Rabindranath writes, Nari ke apon bhaggo joy kodibar keno nahi dibe odhika hebi dhata. Nato kori matha patho prante keno rabo jagi. 
ভ্রান্ত ধৈর্য প্রত্যাশার পূরণের লাগি দুই বা কতদিন রবীন্দ্রনাথ ইজ বেসিক্যালি সেইং ওয়াই উইল দ্য ওমেন ওনলি ওয়েট সো দ্যাট ফেট ক্যান ইন্টারভিন ফর হার উইথ হেড বাউট অ্যান্ড দ্যাট শি উইল নট লাই অ্যাট দি এন্ড অফ দ্য রোড বাট শি উইল ডিমান্ড হার ওন রাইট অ্যান্ড দ্য কনক্লুডিং স্টান্স অফ হে বিধাতা আমাদের এক্ষণা বাক্য হিনা Fate do not keep me silent. Rakte mor jage rudro bina. Within my blood runs the fire of rebel- rebellion. Uttoriya jiboner sharbon nato mohut ter pare. Jiboner sharbot tomo bani jano jhare. So I want to have the, the highest truth of life. Kontho hote nirbari kustote from my voice. Jaha mor onir bachonio tare jano chitto ma jhe. by more people so let me utter what is beyond truth shomoy phuray jodi tobe tar pore shanto hok she nirjor noishabder nistabdh shagore basically talking a chill still she passes away to silence let her voice be heard to conclude then when shomitra asked me to talk about women's property rights and a tagorian perspective i was taken a little aback because this was not an angle that i had really thought about i looked at a few documents and i found two tagors one tagor who carried on the legacy of his family household was dominantly patriarchal and in certain cases extremely let us say contrary to what he preached in his fictions the other was the creative tagor who in many of his manifestations stopped and pleaded for a more robust system of property rights where the woman would be the custodian and would operate this process Rabindranath was of course aware of the new woman who was stepping out from the Antopur the Bahir and my colleagues will know Tonika Sharkar's work and how Hindu nationalism was dominantly while using the image of Shakti and using the enlightenment in the scheme of the public sphere was largely restrictive in the private sphere I would suggest that Rabindranath was a liberal and a radical in many senses but if we keep biddashagor's efforts in context then in terms of women's property rights there is a great dichotomy within rabindranath the tagore who preaches who writes who creates and the tagore who practices are not one and the same that is not to say that rabindranath did not change he did but at least till 1911 till when i get the documents i find this dichotomy and this makes rabindranath even more human for us in my opinion thank you thank you so much amrit uh, for a very wonderful wonderful presentation we have received very positive comments from everyone uh uh i think that we have completely run out of time actually so uh we can't take the questions anymore i know uh, that both of you are very busy people i now request to dr uh, onirban banerji to con- kindly deliver the vote of thanks and i'll just tell all the participants that we have shared the feedback uh, link uh, on the on the youtube uh, feed and you can uh, please fill it up and have your uh, have your uh, certificates in due course of time we we'll, upload it in a week or so okay uh, uh, uh can i just want to uh, do a little bit of self proclamation i do yes, have please. a youtube channel on which uh, i will also share this particular discussion okay. so uh, this also has a number of discussions on rabindranath the plague my some of my classes which are uploaded very regularly on the youtube channel so in case there are people from various disciplines who are watching Uh, I am teaching Panchatantra right at this moment, which might in, uh, interest a lot of people from the Bangla and the uh, Sanskrit discipline. Do uh, 
take a visit and please let me know if you are uh, if you find them interesting thank you okay uh, for the for the record uh, prem and amrit both have their own youtube uh, channels so you can just go and sh uh, have a look at those uh, all our participants and uh, you can put in questions over there if you want and also uh, put forward questions to us if you want which we will forward them to to uh, to resource persons thank you so much prem and thank i'll be more, more than glad to answer them any question you can send them no. show okay. papa okay no okay, okay sure sure thank you so much both of you uh, now uh, dr onirva banerjee will do the vote of thanks thank you somitra uh, i will give the i will now give the vote of thanks uh, firstly i would like to uh, thank dr prem kumar agarwal and dr amrit sir i just summarize what they are saying dr prem kumar agarwal has, uh, has spoken on detail on women's property rights and uh, it's uh, the rights of women and on property in hindu muslim christian parsi religions and dr amrit sir has spoken on government concept of property right as he has shown the contradiction between the liberal government and his uh, conservative views in practice now i will uh, deliver the vote of thanks in nepali adhyapak bhaskar chattopadhyay amader pratishthaner pratishtha proti bochorer moton ei bochoreo bharat vidya charcha kendro adhyapak bhaskar chattopadhyay o srimati konika chattopadhyay sharone bokshita ayojon koreche ei bochor amra bishoy dekhechi মহিলাদের সম্পত্তির অধিকার অন্য বছর থেকে এবছরের আয়োজন একটু আলাদা করোনা পরিস্থিতির জন্য আমরা নেটে বক্তৃতা আয়োজন করতে বাধ্য হলাম এ ব্যাপারে আমাদের সঙ্গে সহযোগিতা করেছেন ডক্টর অরিন্দ মন্ডল ও অধ্যাপক শ্রী দমদুপানি ভট্টাচার্য তাদের আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের মাননীয় সভাপতি অধ্যাপক ডক্টর রূপেন্দ্র কুমার চট্টোপাধ্যায় স্বাগত ভাষণ দেন তাকে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই তার মা খুবই অসুস্থ আমি আমরা তার মায়ের সুস্থ হয়ে তিনি ফিরে আসুক এই প্রার্থনা করি প্রতিবছর আমরা দুইজন কৃতি ছাত্রীকে সম্বর্ধনা দিই এইবার আমরা আমাদের সঙ্গে পেয়েছি মাধ্যমিকের কৃতি ছাত্রী শ্রীজা রায় ও উচ্চ মাধ্যমিকের মাধ্যমিকের কৃতি ছাত্রী করবি আদবকে আমাদের আমন্ত্রণ গ্রহণ করবার জন্য তাদের ধন্যবাদ জানাই আই থ্যাঙ্ক শ্রীজা রায় অ্যান্ড করবি আদক ফর অ্যাকসেপ্টিং আর ইনভিটেশন টু ফেলিসিটেট দেন আমাদের সংগঠনের তরফ থেকে আমাদের মাননীয় সম্পাদক অধ্যাপক ডক্টর শিখা আদিত্য তাদের পুরস্কৃত করেন তার জন্য আমি তাকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের মাননীয় বক্তাদের প্রতি আমরা বিশেষভাবে কৃতজ্ঞ ডক্টর প্রেম কুমার আগরপাল নারীদের সম্পত্তির অধিকারের উপর বক্তৃতা দেন আমাদের আমন্ত্রণ গ্রহণ করবার জন্য এবং এই বিষয়ে মনোজ্ঞ আলোচনা করবার জন্য তাকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের দ্বিতীয় বক্তা ডক্টর অমৃত সেন রবীন্দ্রনাথের নারীদের সম্পত্তির অধিকারের উপর ধারণা নিয়ে বক্তৃতা দেন তার পাণ্ডিত্যপূর্ণ আলোচনার জন্য তাকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই ছাড়া কোনো অনুষ্ঠান হতে পারে না আমি আপনাদের আনন্দের সঙ্গে জানাই যে আমাদের ডাকে একশো নব্বই জন বিদ্যোৎসাহী ব্যক্তি সাড়া দিয়েছেন যেসব বন্ধুরা আমাদের ডাকে সাড়া দিয়ে এই ছুটির দিনে এই অনুষ্ঠানের জন্য সময় দিয়েছেন এবং আমাদের এই অনুষ্ঠান সফল করেছেন তাদেরকে আমাদের সংস্থার থেকে তরফ থেকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমি হ্যাপি টু ইনফর্ম ইউ দ্যাট হান্ড্রেড অ্যান্ড নাইনটি উই হ্যাভ হান্ড্রেড অ্যান্ড নাইনটি পার্টিসিপেন্টস অ্যান্ড আই থ্যাঙ্ক অল অফ ইউ ফর গিভিং ইউর ভ্যালুয়েবল টাইম টু মেক দিস প্রোগ্রাম সাকসেস শেষে এই অনুষ্ঠানটি সুস্থভাবে পরিচালনা করবার জন্য এই অনুষ্ঠানের সহ আহ্বায়ক অধ্যাপক 
সৌমিত্র রায়কে ধন্যবাদ জানাই নমস্কার Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay, for your valuable time. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Amrit. You are friends. So, uh, just not as academicians, I'm so happy that you people have come over here. Thanks for your, for your time. This is a really a very moving tribute to Dr. Bhaskar Chattopadhyay and Srimati Konika Chattopadhyay. Some other time, we'll see all of you. Thanks, participants. Good night, everyone. Stay safe, stay at home. Thank you.